you. If you don't know, today is our last day of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Hopefully it's been going good for you. I'm so proud of you, unless you didn't fast, and then I'm not very proud of you. Um, but there's always next time. I don't judge, but God does, whatever. Uh, but hey, I've been so, so excited in this time to, to pray and fast together as a church. If you've been on our prayer guide uh, we've been praying the same things together every day, which has been really, really exciting. And I've heard a ton of stories. In fact, I wrote a bunch of them down. In these last few weeks, I've heard stories of families reuniting, people coming to faith in Jesus, people finding a, a church home for the first time in over 10 years, some people for the first time ever, stories of multiple people in the last couple of weeks praying, and now they feel called to vocational ministry after prayer and fasting, uh, recommitments to Jesus, recommitments to church, recommitments to their spouse. Uh, we had a, a fun story a couple weeks ago. There was a woman in church who said she got hit by a car. That's not very fun. That's terrifying. But she was here. She said, God protected me. And we said, how are you here? Why are you here? And she said, I had to make sure I was in church this Sunday to thank God for protecting me. We we're like, wow, that's amazing. So just a lot of great stories in this time. So blessed to be a part of it. I've had this verse on my heart in this time. I've been praying over you, Psalm 139. In verse 17, it says this, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. I I've been praying that God's thoughts about you would be made known to you in this time of prayer and fasting. Uh, a couple days ago, there was a guy in our church, he's a friend of mine. He sent me a new worship song. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called On Repeat. On repeat, And even the name of it just kind of struck me because what I began to think about was so often what's on repeat in our minds is the wrong thing. It's our past, it's our sins, it's things that people said about us. Sometimes it's really great fear that's in our life. And a lot of it is just a lie from the enemy. And so I've just been praying that we would have God's thoughts about us on repeat in our minds. And here's why. Um, our lives go where the thoughts on repeat in our minds take us. Our lives often go, the direction in our life is often determined and dictated by what's on repeat in your mind. What you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, what people have said about you. And so knowing what God's thoughts are about you, really important, really critical, especially in this time of prayer and fasting. And so I hope God's given you clarity on that. And really to keep that going, uh, in the month of February as a church, we're going to practice the spiritual discipline of silence of silence. In fact, every month in 2022, we're going to practice a different spiritual discipline together um, as a church. And every month, we've just been praying about it, the pastoral team, what do we feel like our church needs in this time. Uh, one of our goals as a staff in 2022 is to take our people deeper. Um, I love that, you know, we reach new people all the time. We got new believers, young people, new people to church, and that's awesome. And we want to take the people that we have, and we want to take them deeper. And there's a lot of stuff we're doing for that. That's why we're going through the Bible on Sundays when we preach, also reading through a chapter a day. We're going to have a monthly spiritual discipline. First 30 minutes of our day during the week as a staff, we pray together. We pray for you uh, every single day. Right now, we're planning on what it looks like to have a, a night of prayer and worship every month during the week as a church. There's just things that we want to do to take our people deeper. And, and one of these things is the spiritual discipline. And so silence, silence. And silence is a really big deal because often God's voice is quiet, not because it's quiet, but because everything in our, else in our life is loud and we can't really hear God. In fact, this is why Jesus over and over again, we see this about five times in the book of Luke, he goes to a quiet place to hear from God, to be silent, all right? And here's what silence is. The spiritual discipline of silence is the absence of human-created noise in order to receive God-ordained direction. <laughs> I kinda wanna preach on silence now, but we're in a different series, and so I can't do that. But layered into the game plan or our daily devotional, will be this practice of silence, and you're gonna see it this week. In fact, if you wanna grab that, it's on our QR code in front of you. You can grab the weekly game plan, all right? Uh, I want God's thoughts about you to be on repeat in your mind. I kinda of wanna do a series now called On Repeat, but we can't, because we're in the book of Acts, all right? We can't veer off now. In fact, today I'm really excited to jump back into the book of Acts. Has it been good for you? I hope so, I hope it's been good for you. Just to summarize it, the book of Acts is the remarkable story of how an ordinary group of people catalyzed the, the most important, most significant, and largest religious movement in the history of the world. We're talking about blue-collar people, fishermen, all right, doctors in training, IRS agents, many great women who at the time had like no social rights, all right? Um, that really happened. And even if you're not a believer, that's amazing. <laughs> that's incredible that they were able to pull that off. History backs it up that Jesus Christ was born. He lived 33 years. He died. He rose again, 
And he appeared to about 500 people over the course of 40 days. And then he gathered together a ragtag group of followers who are much less, by the way, like the Avengers and much more like the seven dwarves, all right? And he gets them together and he says, I want you to go make disciples in every nation in the world. And they don't really know how big the world is because there's no internet, there's no TikTok, there's no Christian mingle. Can you imagine that? And so they have no idea what they're really getting into. And yet Jesus says, go make disciples in every nation. And then he levitates into the air and disappears in the clouds. And it's like this cliffhanger ending. It's kind of like an inception when the top is spinning and then it wobbles and poof, it's over. Like what happened to Leo? I have no idea. There was no sequel. We're not really sure. What are the disciples supposed to do now? They don't really know. I mean, how are they going to catalyze the, the largest religious movement in the history of the world with no money, no power, no education, no step by step process, by the way? Like, how do you make a disciple? What is ministry? What should the church look like? That's why there's a lot of division in church. We don't really know. We're kind of guessing. We're not exactly sure. There's a lot of different ways to interpret it. And so there is no step-by-step process. What exactly are they supposed to do? They don't know what they're doing. They don't really know what they're doing. And so that's why we see in this book that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's leading them all all throughout this journey, that a lot of times they're doing the wrong thing. And they're kind of messing up, kind of like you and me. And yet the Holy Spirit is overcoming it again and again, building the church even despite them and the things that they're doing. I don't think we've ever seen a less qualified, um, less capable group of people do a more important thing or a more important task. It's encouraging to me for what God has called us to do. There is no step-by-step process. And yet in the book of Acts, we see Jesus building his church. It's not just the Acts of the Apostles. I've said this before, by the way, I'm not really qualified to debate like Bible scholars and Bible translators. I'm going to do it anyway. Does that make me stubborn? Probably. Um, You can pray for me. All right. But I think Jesus is building his church. If we were going to name it after the apostles, I would call it the radical faith of the apostles. Uh, We see in this book that they, they were so successful because they were absolutely certain that Jesus rose from the dead. That's kind of what they fell back on every time. If they got into debates, they couldn't win or had questions they couldn't answer. They'd kind of fall back on, well, he rose from the grave. (laughs) Like, that's good enough for me. And so let's just keep going. Why don't you come on in? They were so excited. They had faith in this first thing is what I call it. It was a salvation thing. It's a life and death thing. It was an ultimate thing. And having faith in this first thing really unified them. In fact, I believe this. I believe that the first Christians were more excited. They were more passionate about what they were for than what they were against. They were more fired up about what they were about, not just being against the people that are around them. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that this is still true today of the church? (laughs) Do you think the church is still more known for what we're for than what we're against? I think sadly, in my opinion, I think more so than maybe in any time in any of our lives, the church according to culture is more known for what we're against. Not just what we are, but who we're against. The people we're against, we'd love to tell you about it sometimes, rather than what we're for. We're for Jesus and we're for people. In fact, all you gotta do sometimes is watch the news for a couple minutes, look at someone's Facebook or Meta or whatever it's called. You talk to someone for three minutes and sometimes they love to tell you about all the Republicans and the Democrats and the Vaxxers and the Maskers and the Charismatics or the Southern Baptists, whatever. All the people that we're kind of against and that we don't like. There's a lot of division in the church and that's actually what we're gonna read about today. And it's not very hard to find it. You know, I think media loves talking about it because gossip sells and drama sells and division sells. We eat it up. We love it. The problem is God hates it. I think God hates division in his own church, and yet it happens a lot. And I think that that's no wonder why the enemy wants to divide us. Here's why, because he knows this. If our enemy can divide us, our enemy can defeat us. Maybe not for eternity, us being with Jesus, but maybe for today as we reach other people so they can be with Jesus too. And so I think there's a good amount of division in church today. In fact, that's what I wanna talk about. What divides the church? What divides the church is what I wanna talk about today. Just a nice, fun, light, easy message on AFC and NFC Championship Sunday. Yeah, let's get this in first before we watch that. And to to talk about that, we're gonna be in Acts chapter 15. If you got a Bible, you can pull it out. We're going to be in Acts 15 today, which is perfect because the church in Acts 15 faced a problem. And this problem was so big um, that it literally could have derailed the entire mission of the church. And I don't mean to overstate this, but if they don't deal with this issue the way that they did, we might not be here right now. A lot of division faced the church. The leaders in the church at this time 
began to have theological debates about such things as law and politics and cussing and alcohol and maybe bigger than all that. What do we do with this stuff when we don't agree? <laughs> because let's be honest, we don't, all, we don't always agree. Wouldn't it be nice if we just all agreed on stuff, but we don't? And so it makes for what I call interesting unity, you know? Like we're in unity, kind of, not sure. <laughs> we're not really sure. Do we really, do we really feel like we're in unity? What do we do when, when we don't agree? Do we start another church? Do we start another denomination? What are we supposed to do? Let's go ahead and read about it. Acts chapter 15 in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. It says, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, four men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, it's important to note that most of the church at this point are Jewish people. They grew up with Old Testament law. They've been indoctrinated into it. All right? And one law was this thing called circumcision, which was the process by which, you know what? You can Google it, all right? If you don't know what it is by now, society has failed you, whatever. But it was a law, and we see it right here in Deuteronomy. And why was it a law? It was one way for God's people to sep separate themselves from the rest of the world. All right. If you really want to be a child of God, you got to get circumcised. And I think that made a lot of dads like stay in the car when their family went to church. Like, I'm just going to stay in here. I'm not feeling well. I'm not sure why. I'm going to stay back. Verse two, Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently or passionately. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. What do we do with this? Now, Paul at this point has already established himself as the world's premier missionary, church planner, writer, the greatest the world's ever known. Like, we're studying his books 2,000 years later. If you wrote a book and somebody was studying it 20 years later, that'd be a wild success, all right? This is 2,000 years later. He's got a lot to do, and yet he's got to walk all the way from Antioch to Jerusalem, which is a very long walk. Why? Because this was so serious, and it was so important. He had to show up in person. He couldn't just send an email. Verse 6, it says this, So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood up and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles. By the way, you should know what a Gentile is. Gentile is an English word that comes from a Greek word, ethne, which is where we get ethnic or ethnicity, and it means cultures or other people groups. And so at this time, ethnics were anybody who wasn't a Jew. That's who ethnics were. Gentiles were to Jewish people. Anybody who wasn't Jewish people. And that was actually a problem for them because they had a lot of pride and elitism above people who weren't Jewish people because we're the real children of God. We're the chosen people. And so they felt like we don't really need anybody else. And yet they have to be reminded that Jesus has preached to all nations. Some people forgot that. Peter's like, did you forget that Jesus told us to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. Verse eight, God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them. And I think Peter's preaching this like, are we still talking about this? We've talked about this before. Are we still really on this? Jesus cleansed their hearts through faith and then he really challenges them. Verse 10, so why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile or new believers with a yoke or a burden that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? In other words, he's like, were you keeping all the laws? Because I wasn't. <laughs> you, you were keeping all 613 laws, really? Like circumcision is a tough one. That's one. There's 612 to go. He's like, you were keeping the one about the Sabbath, really? Like there was this one about the Sabbath where you could only take a certain amount of restricted steps or you would violate it. It's kind of like the keto diet. You can only have a certain restricted amount of carbs and therefore a certain restricted amount of joy or you violate it, right? You can't, you can't do it. And so he's like, were you really doing that? Were you keeping all the laws? Because I wasn't and I was better at it than you were. were. You really think you were. And so if we were trained and we grew up on it as Jewish people and we couldn't keep it, why would we hold it over their heads? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, and by the way, verse 11, we believe that we're all saved the same way anyway, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Like, these things didn't save us anyway. We were saved not by what we did, but by what Jesus did. Why do we need to be reminded of this again? Let's leave these people alone. And then they say, hey, let's just write a letter to clear the air for the whole church so they can understand kind of what we decided. Verse 23 says this. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders. Your brothers in Jerusalem, it is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and 
Cilicia. Cilicia? No, that'd be Italian. That's probably not it. Um, Greetings, verse 24. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we didn't send them, all right? They weren't invited. They weren't really sent by us, so we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who've risked their lives for the name of Jesus. We're sending Judas, not that Judas, all right? The other Judas. Can you imagine your name Judas at that time? That'd be hard. You're like throwing a party. You're like, we invited Judas. And people are like, what? Like, not that one. All right, the other one. We invited the other one. Verse 27, we're sending the other Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. All right, we went from 613 to three. Here's what they are. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols. Fair. You must abstain from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals. Seems fine to me. And you must abstain from sexual immorality. Now, it's important to note that this idea of sexual immorality, which I define as sexual acts, sexual body parts, with someone that you're not married to, that was a foreign idea to the whole world. That was only really held in Jewish culture. And so I don't think that they're elevating sexual sin above other sin. They're just teaching people something they've never heard before. They don't even know what these things are. What's most interesting, though, is that the list is over. (laughs) This is all he says, and then he says, if you do this, you'll do well. Adios. Farewell. Like, that's that's all he says. (laughs) And I don't know about you, that kind of kills me. It's like, what about about politics? What about cussing? What about alcohol? He just didn't, didn't address any of these things, which is interesting. Now, I believe the Bible teaches us how to love God and follow God in all these areas of life, but but Paul and the apostles don't give a lot of time to it. They don't want to make up a bunch of rules and a bunch of laws. They don't want to do that. They're they're not giving a lot of attention to what I would call external conformity. They're really wanting people to to know and love Jesus. I'd call that inner transformation. When you you make up too many rules and laws and there's too many things to follow and there's too long of a to-do list, now it's not so much about loving God and loving people which is what's most important to Jesus according to Mark chapter 12. When you have too many rules and laws, the focus is now on what Martin Luther calls works righteousness, where we have a list of to-dos, of things that we must do, and these determine if we really know God or if we're really spiritual or not. And what is the to-do list in church today? That's kind of what I was thinking about this week, because let's be honest, we're not really struggling with circumcision, I don't think. If you are, we'll pray for you, but that's not really on our list. That's what they were struggling with. All right, here's one thing that maybe we struggle with in church today, alcohol. What do we do with alcohol? There are some people in church that say that this is wrong and sinful to consume it at all. And, and there are some reasons behind that why that might be actually a good argument for some people. It can be very harmful. The Bible warns us against the abuse of alcohol. I did some research this week. According to the Washington Post, one in eight adults in America are alcoholics. One in 10 children grew up in an alcohol abused home. There are 95,000 alcohol-related deaths a year. And if you say, I don't want to drink it, or I don't want it in my house, because of these things, I commend you. Those are not bad reasons. But there's another side of it that says, well, we shouldn't throw it out just because it's abused. Because if that's the case, we should throw out sex and money and words. (laughs) We are practicing silence. Maybe we should throw out words. Maybe we should throw out food. Like 95,000 deaths seems like a lot. There are 325,000 deaths a year related to food and obesity. Maybe we should throw that out. And so we shouldn't throw out things just because they are abused, right? Paul actually prescribes a little bit of alcohol to Timothy at one point. And it's easy to say maybe it's bad, but then there are people in the New Testament that are drinking it, kind of like Jesus and other people. And so it's kind of hard to argue that, that it's bad altogether. And so I think that we should leave this a relational thing. And when I say relational thing, I mean it's between you and God, it's between you and and Jesus. Is it good for you to drink it? Is it, good, is it good for you and your family? And if we're being honest, sometimes we're not honest enough about that between us and God. We're not really asking God. We're kind of doing what we want. I think it is a relational thing. But I think a lot of times in church, we want to make it a law thing because it is dangerous. And I think sometimes as church leaders, and you see this a lot throughout history, we're afraid that people are going to keep sinning, and so we've got to make more rules. <laughs> we've got to help them out. And that's not really what we're seeing. In Acts chapter 15, or even in Romans 14, we don't really have time to talk about that today. But that's not the spirit of what's going on. The spirit of what's going on is how do we serve each other better and have really an affection for Jesus? And how do we build that relationship to where he can speak to me? Because there are certain areas and denominations and churches say, no, you gotta do this, you gotta sign this if you wanna be a part of this. And I'm over here like, why do we do that? We don't need to do that. 
We don't, we don't need to just make up a whole bunch more rules. We, we don't need to do that. It should be a relational thing. But what do you do when you have a church full of people who don't agree on this stuff? That's hard. It makes for really interesting unity and what I would call bad religion. In fact, here's what religion looks like a lot of the time. Being religious often looks like us putting our own personal convictions on top of other people. Here's what God has said to me, even though it's not very clear in Scripture, and there's a lot of things that are very clear in Scripture. I think sexual immorality is very clear in Scripture. Abortion, things like these get very clear. But then there are other things like this or other things going on in the world today that are not super clear. And instead of, instead of letting it be a relational thing between you and God, it kind of becomes a law thing. How about politics? That's fun. Should we talk about that for a minute? That's great. Before I say anything about politics, let me just say this. I, I think the Bible should shape how we think about everything. We should all adopt what, what, we, what would be known as a biblical worldview. You look at the news and what's going on in the world through the lens of the Bible. The Bible should teach us about abortion and immigration and taxes and all these things. All right, But, but what's happening in church today is there are certain positions that are, that are really relevant in, in, in culture and in politics right now. There are certain positions that people take and we're turning them into religious law. And it's like, depending on where you land on which side, that kind of determines if you're right with God or not, or if you're spiritual or not, as if we know people's hearts and we kind of don't. <laughs> and I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that you should soften your political convictions. You might be totally right on your political convictions, convictions and everything that you believe. But I think the problem is it often becomes an obstacle for us to love people, pray for people, give grace, and care about what Acts 15 calls the Gentile or the new believer. I think it makes our heart cold and hard towards people as the church. In fact, I've been saying this for months. In fact, I'll just say it like this. In the last 18 months to two years, there's been a lot of things going on in the world, a lot. And depending on who you are and what you value, you've been paying attention to certain things more than others, like which thing you care about the most. To some people, the race conversation is the most important thing. To other people, it's who became president, maybe it's vaccines, maybe it's what they're teaching in school. There's a lot of options. And depending on who you are, there's one that matters the most to you. <laughs> Let me tell you the one that matters the most to me, all right? There is something I believe the enemy has been doing for a long time, and especially in the last couple of years, and I've been saying this for months. I believe that in this time, the devil is trying to make the church's heart cold towards the world, hard towards the world, more so than ever before. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it more so than any time in history for me being in church. People that are like, let's get away from people. Let's get away from darkness. Let's just get away from people who are crazy and don't know the truth because the world's getting worse. So let's run away from it. And as we do that, we're literally running away from our calling and acts. Like what happens when the light of the world doesn't want to be the light anymore? We just want to get away from the darkness. Let's all be go shine over here because it's brighter and the darkness is really dark. I don't know if it's ever been this dark. Let's just go shine over here. We're not doing our job anymore. And so for me, I think that the enemy has been wanting to make our hearts cold and hard. Why? Because when that happens, you don't pray for people, we scoff at people. I've said this for months. And I think one of the biggest ways that he's done this is through politics and political positions and stances where these things become, again, have the conversations, believe what you believe, but it often becomes an obstacle. Now we can't really pray for people or care for people because these things are religious law and they're actually more important to us. And we can't fulfill the Great Commission and actually reach people. And I think when that happens, I think a secondary thing gets elevated to a first thing. And it overshadows the gospel. And I just don't want to see that happen. In fact, I believe there's a lot of people in church that wish their pastor would talk more about political stuff. And I think a lot of that stuff's very clear. I named a few a minute ago. But the, but the reason I'm, I'm becoming less and less desirous to do that, all right, is because I'm starting to think now that that's not really a high but a low place for the church to be is to take these positions on stuff because it kind of gets in the way of the gospel. I don't want the church to be a political pawn in the chess game of culture. I think that's a low place for the church to be because we have a much more important message to tell people about, and it's the message of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I would like people on both sides of the aisle to come to church and hear about Jesus and find a home. I would like that. I think Jesus wanted that. I'll prove it to you. Here's something you probably didn't Think about when you're reading the Gospels. When Jesus put together his band of 12 disciples, there were certain guys he handpicked that were very interesting, all right? One of them was this guy named Simon the Zealot. And Zealots were a very radical, aggressive political party who wanted to rise up by any means necessary to rise up against the Roman Empire, to secede or get away from them. 
That was one guy. Oh, and another guy was Matthew, the tax collector, who went around collecting money to strengthen the Roman government. Jesus picked both of these guys to be on the same team to do the same thing. That's kind of crazy to me. Now, did, could they sit around and talk about these things over a Stella Artois? I'm not really sure. Could they talk about where they stood? I don't know. But for the moment, somehow they agreed that for the moment we, that we tell people about Jesus and his saving power, let's put the ballot down for just a minute. We could talk about it later. It's really, it is important. But somehow they got to a place where talking about Jesus and telling people about him was actually more important to us. And I think today there's a lot of people, we can't do that. We can't sit around and talk about these things because it's too, it, it, we get too offended. Maybe our heart is too hard. And I think we have to have these conversations. Why? Because there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus. And I think a lot of times this becomes a roadblock for them. Look, look at how James, by the way, sums this up. James is the half-brother of Jesus. By the way, if you want to know that Jesus was God, his brother called him God. Think about how hard that would be for you. That's a different topic, whatever. He calls him God. Now he's one of the heads of the church. Here's how he sums it up. Acts 15, verse 19. I think he nails it. Here's what he says. And so here's my judgment on the whole thing. He says this. We should not make it difficult for Gentiles to turn to God. I think we should engrave that on the side of the building. <laughs> Why do we do the things that we do? I don't want to make it hard for people to come to church and find Jesus. There are things that become obstacles and get in the way, and we should actually want to eliminate those. In fact, here's another way to say it. All right, we should not want to make it hard for new people to be welcomed into our church and find Jesus. That's the Weston's modern day paraphrase right there. Okay, that's how I say it. Once you go third person, you never go back. That's dangerous, whatever. But we don't wanna make it hard for people to come to know Jesus. That's why we do what we do. By the way, that's why we ask you to serve on a team. Not so you can do your good deed for the day, so that when people come here, it's not hard for them to get in and hear about Jesus. There's people helping them park and pouring into their kids and helping you worship. That's why we do this. That's why we're in a project called End Spiritual Loneliness, to raise some fun money, not just to have it and collect it and look at it. <laughs> we actually want to expand and start other locations. So when people come here, it's not hard to park. Last week, somebody said that they had to park three blocks away at the 930 service. I'm like, that, what do we do with that? That's just when most people like to go to church. You know, I, I, that's hard. That's difficult. And at 11, two blocks away at, at the 11, it was like... I, how, how do we actually make that easier? I don't want roadblocks for people. We've had that happen before. We had a lady say she drove around and just went home. <laughs> I was like, I hope she watched online. We're not really sure. And so that's not really helpful. By the way, next week we have a massive announcement for the End Spiritual Loneliness Project. We have a big update and announcement. I don't mean to be a tease. Something to do with children. We're launching it in the fall. That's all I'm going to say for now, all right? But this is why we do the things that we do. We don't want to make it hard for people to come to know Jesus. I don't wanna make it hard for new people to connect with God by stigmatizing their sin or their struggle over others. I think a big one in church today is homosexuality. And although I believe that the Bible makes it very clear that that is a sin, that is not a sin that is greater than my sin. And I don't think we should look at it that way even though it's often painted that way. I don't think the question is what type of sin, the question is do you call it sin and are you actively working on repentance? I think that matters a lot more. I don't want to make it hard for people of any ethnicity to come to church here. We have people of every skin color on our serve team and most skin colors on our staff. I think that's something we could even do better at in the future and get more diverse on. We shouldn't want to make it hard for Democrats to come to church here by mixing in political messaging with the gospel as if they're the same thing. And they're often not. I don't want to make it hard for Republicans to come to church here for the same reason. And we shouldn't want to make it hard for Dodgers fans, Raiders fans, and I'm told Azusa Pacific fans, I guess, which is, which is the, uh, the rival of Point Loma Nazarene. That's what I'm told. All right, I had to ask. Thank you, John Scott, volleyball coach, Point Loma Naz. I had to text him. Uh, is it the Sea Lions? Can somebody confirm that? Yeah. It's the Sea Lions. Okay, terrifying, right? That's a terrifying mascot. Sea Lions. <laughs> we needed a laugh, desperately, all right? But but here's the point. Our message is a life and death message. And I don't think there's another cause or message on the face of the earth that comes anywhere close to it. What really divides the church? I think it's when we elevate our opinions to the place of the gospel. I think that's a problem. I think that it actually creates obstacles for people to come. He says, don't make it hard for people to find me. Listen, I don't want to get in the way of people finding the Lord. I don't want to do it. I want to speak the truth with boldness and clarity and very directly. And we will when those topics come up. And some of that involves politics, so be it. 
It's in the Bible. We're going to talk about it. That's just the way that it is. But there are certain things that are being elevated, and I think that's how the church divides maybe even the most. And so there are things, though, that, that we would call, I would call first things that are most important. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Creation, heaven and hell are a real place. I believe that the Bible is the word of God. It doesn't change. It doesn't have error. I believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and active today. Gifts are for today. I believe the church is God's plan for the world. Maybe there's one or two more. All right, maybe we should do a series on it. I've been thinking maybe we'll talk about this next week a little bit more. Maybe we'll do a part two. We need to know what we're for because that's what the Christians in the first church knew. Why were they so successful? They knew what they were for more than just who they were against. They weren't really focused on that. You, you don't see Jesus like dueling it out with the devil in the gospels all that much. He didn't give him a lot of attention. We give him much more attention than Jesus did. Jesus wasn't really impressed with him. He just went around and did what, whatever my father tells me to do wherever I go wherever my father tells me to go. And so they knew what they were for. And so I gotta talk, I got like four minutes, but I gotta talk about one thing that we're for. I got one point today, all right? And maybe next week we'll continue. But here's, here's one thing, and it's kind of what I started with, all right? One thing that we're for, that we know for sure, that Jesus rose from the grave. Again, it's why the disciples were so successful. Because no matter what division they faced, they fell back on this. Like he crawled out of the grave, and that's good enough for me. And if we actually believe that every day, it would shape the way that we live life. When they would get in arguments they couldn't win with the Pharisees, they would just fall back on this every single time. You know, I don't know if you ever get in arguments with really, really smart people. Like sometimes you know you're right, but you can't convince them because they're good with words and they're good arguers. This happened to disciples all the time. In, in Acts chapter four, Peter, who's a fisherman, went in front of the Sanhedrin, a really smart guys. It's a legislative high council. You get on the Sanhedrin because you're really smart and you have seven degrees on the wall. That's how you get on the wall. And they're debating about Jesus. And the Bible says that they even notice that they're unschooled and they don't know how to talk. That's what the Bible says. They're like, we believe in what Jesus did or had done. Pardon my past participle. Like they didn't even know how to say it right. And, and the people noticed this. And, but, 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 but the Bible says that they let them go anyway because they were so impressed with their faith. They let them go. They arrest them. They're like, you guys can go. You guys are crazy. Your faith is radical. They believed so wholeheartedly that Jesus rose from the grave. In fact, that's one of the most compelling cases for me that Jesus did rise. It's their reaction to it. They were in terror in safe houses and locked doors at the end of the Gospels. And now they're like, not worried if they die or not, kind of trying to share Jesus with people. It's wild. It's wild. And if we really believe that Jesus got out of that grave, I think it would change the way we handle hard questions in life. It would change the way that we look at things that we don't understand. There's a lot of things in life that are not explainable. But if Jesus appeared right now and he said, hey, listen, I'm not going to give you every answer to all your questions. I will one day, but maybe I want on this side of eternity because I want you to have faith. Just trust me. And he poof and he vanished. Would that be good enough for you? Would you be able to suspend all the things that are confusing to you and that you can't really explain and that you don't really understand? Why? Because I believe that he rose from the grave. In fact, I'll say it like this. I think the unexplainable is trumped by the undeniable. What's the undeniable? He rose from the grave. There are things I can't explain, but I trust him. I trust him. I think a lot of times we want, we want to understand God, and we, I think that can make us critical of God. We should be critical thinkers, but if we're not careful, we can become critical of God like culture is, right? Where, where, where when good things happen, it was the earth or something, but when bad things happen, we like to blame God. Why did God let that happen? That's not okay. And we can become critical of God where we think we're better than God, because, all because we don't understand something. Listen, God asks us to trust him, not understand him. That's not a command anywhere in scripture. We need to understand everything. Disciples did not understand much, but they believed every day that he rose from the grave. Like these guys are debating, and at some point the disciples are like, listen, we're not gonna convince you, we're not good with words. No offense to your degrees, but if it comes down to trusting a guy with degrees on the wall or a guy that crawled out of the grave, we're gonna go with the guy that crawled out of the grave. Like that's good enough for me. And that helps with a lot of things in life that we do not understand. That I trust that he rose. I believe that daily. And if I do, I can be like the disciples. I can push through things I don't understand that are very difficult for me, the doubts that I have in my life. I think it's amazing how we can believe that he has the power to save us from death, hell, and the grave. But we often don't have the faith to believe that he can save us from the power of our insecurities or the, or the power of, I don't have enough money right now or I feel lonely right now. Listen, often... We're good at remembering that he died for our eternity, but bad at remembering he's providing for our today. 
He's moving right now. I believe that he rose. And that affects everything that we knew. The disciples knew that. Again, they didn't know a whole lot else. They believed in a message that was much stronger and more important than anything else. And so when it came to division, they're like, can we just agree on this? This is our first thing. Let it unite us. This was a moment, I think, for the church. And if they didn't deal with it the way that they did, I think it could have derailed everything. Listen, there are churches and denominations that face Acts 15 and they don't make it. They don't make it because we can't, we can't rally around what we do agree on. We're so focused on what we can't agree on. And so we should talk more about what we're for and what we do believe, right? I don't, I don't wanna be a people that has a hard heart towards the world. I wanna make it easy for people to come and find the Lord. And if you don't believe today, or you know someone that doesn't believe, that's the message that God wants to know you. And he, and he came through the grave. He came all the way here from heaven. He just wants to know you. And he died for you. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. And sometimes in life, there's a lot of things that get in the way of that. And we should just say, I'm sorry. There's things that we care about, we're passionate about, but I, we don't wanna get in the way of that because that's the most important thing. And if we can agree on that, we can help shape our city. <laughs> and we could see a lot of great things that God could do all around us. And so I wanna go ahead and pray for us. And if, if you're in here today and you say, I wanna know Jesus more, intimate way. I want to pray for you. Would you bow your heads with me as we close? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gospel. I thank you that you came running after us when we were not coming anywhere near you. Sometimes we're running away from you. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our convictions in different areas of our life, even politics or alcohol or, or whatever, sexuality. I pray that we would let the Bible dictate the way we think about everything. But God, I pray that ultimate, our ultimate mission in life would be to share you with people. This message that you wanna know people, you wanna come close. You came from heaven down to save us, to take our penalty, our place on the cross so that we can have an intimate relationship with you. If we would just believe, if we would just say, God, I surrender to you. I wanna follow you all the days of my life. In fact, if that's you today, I just wanna pray for you. Say, that's me. I wanna give my life to Jesus. You just pray, God, I surrender. You are my Lord. I wanna follow you. I repent, I wanna turn away from the way I was living, the sin that's in my life. I want to follow you, I wanna spend eternity with you. And if that's you today, we just wanna say that this church largely exists for this moment and for you to say, we don't wanna make it hard for you to come know the Lord and feel welcome here. And so God, we pray for anybody who's in that place and in that space that says, I wanna follow you in a new and fresh way. I pray you'd become the realest thing in their life. Would we rally around them like a good church family and say, we're here for you? to walk with you from here. We're proud of you and we love you. Let this be our ultimate thing. So God, I pray we'd continue to have conversations about all kinds of stuff, but would we pursue unity and focus on what we're for? God, we're for you and I'm for this area and this community, people to know you, no matter where they come from, what they believe. Help us sift through that. That's a hard conversation. That's a hard line to walk right now in the world. It's becoming harder. I pray it wouldn't be hard for us, God. We're bold about what we're for. And so, Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.